I wanted to talk to Kristen Archer of I Heart Hamilton about Boris Brat, in part because I know that Kristen is around everywhere and so much a part of Hamilton and would have met Boris at one time or another. But I also saw her beautiful posts that she did from, I guess it was one of the um, street the street crawls where Boris was up there with the Arkells. And I just thought it was such a beautiful Hamilton moment. And so Kristen Archer, welcome to the program. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks so much. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do want to get your thoughts on how the city's going. We're coming up to an election, and I always love your your point of view. Uh, and I appreciate that you follow the OSHA so closely, so you're you're up to speed on sort of all the conversations that are happening. But could you tell me what you felt when you heard that, first of all, that Boris had died, and then the way in which he was killed, struck down by a hit-and-run driver taking a walk in this neighborhood? Yeah, it's just it's such an it's an unthinkable tragedy. I know so often, way too often now we're hearing about um, pedestrians not being safe uh, on the street. And, and so many people are calling for calling attention to the, so many streets in the city intersections that are not safe. Um, so to hear that someone was struck and then later in the day to hear who it was such a prominent figure. Obviously, anyone um, in that circumstance is this horrible tragedy. Um, but to hear that it was Boris was just so shocking. Um, it's, you know, one of those things that it touches so many people in the city. It's hard to think of a, kind of the last figure like this in Hamilton that really just rocks the entire um, music community and also in the Canadian music scene more broadly, such a renowned figure. Um, it was just so shocking. So we have a great panel following our conversation, talking about the issues around cycling safety and, yeah. and pedestrian safety and street safety here in Hamilton. Um, and hopefully we'll make some progress on, on making our streets safer as a result of that conversation. So I hope everyone stays tuned for that. But Kristen, I wanted to kind of get your sense of Boris himself, uh, because when I met him was about 10 years ago, I was doing a podcast called The Laircast, where we wanted to speak to Hamilton's 50th 50 Hamilton's interesting people. And so Boris Brout was right up there on the list. He, I guess, back in the day was voted one of the most uh, appreciated Hamiltonians. Everyone loved him. I didn't know what to expect from this maestro coming into my little podcast, but he couldn't have been more delightful and kind and funny and how I didn't realize what a prodigy he was as a child. And I just thought he was just wonderful to speak to and a wonderful person. And I heard on Facebook after he passed that a friend of his said how much he enjoyed doing that, that little podcast all those years ago. So he just seemed to me to be someone of, as you said, international renown, but loved Hamilton, gave up his time freely. Yeah, yeah. When I, I started blogging about Hamilton in 2011, it was when I looked back, I realized just how many music memories I had over those years that involved uh, Boris Brad. He was so ingrained uh, in Hamilton's music scene. And I think even years before the blog, I think he gave so many Hamiltonians their first experience with live orchestral music and made it cool and exciting. Um, and so definitely I'm one of those people that uh, saw him very, very young in concert. Of course, he was formerly the director, music director of the HPO and and then founded these huge uh, music institutions, the National Academy Orchestra of Canada, the Brought Music Festival. Um, these are huge um, parts of Hamilton's rich music history. Um, and as you said, yeah, for him to be so internationally renowned, but still so enthusiastic about Hamilton's music scene, so passionate about emerging artists as well and wanting to help them out, um, that, that's so telling how, you know, his roots were here and um, wanted to, to bring so much music. And I think really not just orchestral, but with the Brat Music Festival, they brought attention to, to opera, to classical, to rock. Um, it was really exciting, the programming that they bring. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about the photo that you've uh, allowed me to use with the Osho, the one of yeah. him on stage at the Arkells. What was that moment like? What was going on in that shot? Yeah, so this was an art crawl of July 2014, um, just headed down that evening. You, know, you don't know what you're going to expect at Art Crawl. Um, and there was a surprise pop-up show hosted by Super Crawl. It was a collaboration between Arkells and Boris Brat and the National Academy Orchestra. And uh, it was at the Gasworks. It was a relatively new space at the time. It was just a 70-person capacity at the time. Um, they Dr. Dis released tickets. Everyone grabbed them quickly, rushed over to the Gasworks. Um, and it was great to see Arkells at the time. They debuted songs from their upcoming album, High Noon, that later came out that summer. And it was just so electric to see a full orchestra with Arkells in this tiny space. 
um, first time hearing some of these songs and, uh, you know, it was like they might as well have been in an arena. They all performed with that much energy. It was so amazing. And uh, Boris brought it one time as in the, the photo there, he hopped down and started singing into Max Kerman's microphone. So again, just that example of his enthusiasm, uh, no matter what he was doing, where he was, um, his passion for music, uh, it was always such a joy to see. Do you want to add anything else? Uh, yeah, just so many highlights. I'll I'll add that that collaboration with Arkells led to them performing at the Juno Awards together. It was another huge Hamilton music moment to have the Juno Awards here in 2015. So seeing them on stage together there was such a thrilling experience as well. Um, and then as recently as last summer, I went out to the Ancaster Fairgrounds to see the, the Brat Festival's sold out drive-in show celebrating the music of Queen. So knowing that, you know, they were preparing for this summer. I mean, right, it was always... Uh, always new innovative programming coming out of the, the Brat Music Camp and um, right up, in, um, up until the end. So, yeah. Uh, well, I hope that there is some sort of permanent edifice in Hamilton or something that can be dedicated to Boris Brat um, to, I mean, his legacy, I think, lives in all, everyone who was, ever met him or ever took music or was inspired by him or played with him. But uh, certainly it'd be great to have something to see of him all the time because he had such a positive impact on our city. Um, I want to bring up with you, Kristen, because I know we, we talk about, you know, vision for Hamilton and what we need going forward. And we're almost at the election. It's so close. And one of the mayoral candidates, uh, Keenan Loomis, I saw him tweet about Boris, but also say, you know, another example of carnage on our streets. And I don't know if he's going to make this a political platform to make our streets safer. Um, but I, I certainly do feel, and tell me if you feel the same way, that we need to hear real vision from our candidates in this election for mayor. We need to hear about people who really have ideas to make this city a, a better place. Where are you at with all of that since the last time we spoke here on the O show. Yeah, definitely. We've seen a few more people uh, either step down and say they're not running again, or we've had some more step up. So that's positive. I hope we see um, a little more of that, more people in the runnings, particularly in the, in the Hamilton councillors. I'm looking at the different wards and hoping yeah. we see more new voices um, come forward because we've, we've seen still continuing at the council meetings, you know, the, the decorum is not there between the old guard and, and the, the new, newer councillors. Um, so that really needs to change. So I hope we see more people coming forward and running. And so only, only to interject for a second there. I don't know if you're referring to last week's O show, but we ran the clip of Narinder and the mayor, yeah. right? And 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 Terry Whitehead, and it just looked like a cacophony of nonsense. And it was just, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm so ready for us not to have to look at our council and be embarrassed. Yeah, and yeah, it's just inexcusable behavior. And we need to see, you know, it's an embarrassment to the city that they can't, uh, you know, hold a meeting without something like that happening. Um, so I do hope we see more people continue to run. You know, we're, we're six months out. So hopefully, you know, it's now or never <laughs> to put your hat in the ring um, and the campaigning can really begin. Um, yeah, and something like the unsafe streets, I think we, we've seen neighborhoods, um, just residents calling for it time and time again, and it's a tragedy that it would take something as big as an event like this to make change. I hope we do see it um, after something like this, because I spoke to even residents who have lived in that area, and it's it's a common occurrence for speed and um, on those streets and, and residential neighborhoods, so something needs to change. Um, and it, the fact that it's preventable, right? You know, yeah. to have Boris brought cut down in a hit and run accident, then to have another Hamiltonian days later same thing um we shouldn't be dying on our streets for taking a walk you know we need to fix this so i hope there's a political will for that as you mentioned the election is coming may 2nd is the day that you know it's official you know uh and candidates i think have until the end of june to get all organized and announce themselves but you know stay tuned to the o show because to your to your hope kristen uh i know of some people who are announcing i can't say who <laughs> i've been sworn to secrecy but there are definitely going to be some fascinating people entering the race. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, we have an opportunity, I really feel it, to make some serious change. And, and I know they all watch the O Show, so I'm, I'm hoping that these kind of conversations remind them that the people of Hamilton love our city, but it needs to get better, right? We, we need to have a better culture around that city hall table, as you said. It's an embarrassment to our city. It's, it's not functional. Uh, and I think we see that. I think we see the outcome of our bad politics in our bad policy. 
Uh, and that bad policy can be costly, whether it's sewer gate or it's our unsafe streets or whatever, you know, it puts Hamiltonians at risk. So we have an opportunity to all get out and vote. And if you are enjoying these conversations on the O Show as well, uh, please subscribe on YouTube. That way we can keep building this community show and getting the content to everyone. Kristen Archer, I Heart Hamilton. Check out her blog uh, and her ideas and her show on CFMU, correct? Uh, do you want to give a plug for the show? Yes, Fridays at 2 p.m., cfmu.ca. Yeah. Awesome. You're the best, Kristen. I love your mom, too. Say hi to her. Yes, I will. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and we'll have you back on the O Show. But thanks for everything that you do as a voice people trust on the issues they care about and as someone who is constantly putting forward the best parts about our city. It's such a pleasure to have you on the program. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> One of the things we always like to do here on the O Show is to hear from a variety of voices. And so we're always excited to bring some new people into our panel discussions. And we have a lot to talk about today, especially after the tragic loss of Boris Brat. And since another Hamilton pedestrian has been cut down by a hit and run driver, we're up to eight this year alone. And we're only in April. We haven't even hit Easter yet. I think it's a travesty, a travesty of leadership. And I wanted to talk to some Hamiltonians who have been vocal around the issue uh, and who have their own perspective on Hamilton politics. So let me introduce the panel. Brenda Duke, it is so great to have you join the O Show for the first time. You are a volunteer, an engaged citizen. You're very involved in your Ward 3. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I can't wait to hear your thoughts, uh, especially in an election year, right? We really need to know how people are feeling on the ground in Hamilton. And also, Chris Ritzma, welcome to the program. First time having you on as well, sir. Thank you for having me. Now, you came to Hamilton four years ago, like I did, although 25 or so years ago, but by choice, you came to us from Burlington uh, and you were part of the Hamilton Cycling Committee, although you're not speaking here as an official uh, spokesperson for the committee, but what brought you to the city and why the engagement in cycling? Uh, for me, it was, it was the urban feel. It was that uh, ability to be close to things like you do in Toronto, but without the incredible uh, crowds that you see in, in places like Toronto, it's more livable for sure for me. And in terms of cycling, it's just, for me, it's when I moved here, the cycling infrastructure was already here and it's just the easiest way to get around. And I just want to encourage more people to, to do that and to continue to go further on my bike without feeling like I've traveled onto something that's not, not somewhere for me. Right, somewhere that's not safe. And Mark Cripps, of course, uh, a returning champion to the O Show. <laughs> Mark, with a provincial election right about to drop and with the municipal election, people starting to register as of May 2nd, there's so much going on in this town. But first, let me just start with you. Did you know Boris at all? Had you had engagements or interactions with him over the years? Yes, Laura. Um, yeah, when I was, uh, obviously, when I worked in the newspaper business and was managing editor, Boris was a regular caller uh, to the newspaper paper I'd met him a couple of times always promoting um you know the Boris Brot Music Festival just I you know just a tremendous and kind and and just you know such a such a brutal loss for this community um and my condolences to his family and all his loved ones and everybody who knew him um a big loss for us and so how did you feel when you heard not just that Boris had passed Mark but that um it was for something as insane as he was just walking in the morning and got cut down by a hit and run driver. I mean, how did that make you feel given all you know about Hamilton's road safety? You know, Laura, you know, brought back memories for me of my own brother being killed uh, in 1988. Now, mind you, that was a, an, you know, an auto accident right in front of our house, um, mm -hmm. car plowed in from behind. But, you know, what, that, what it really brought for me is sort of like, you know, I think we've grown immune to the um, sorrow and the grief that people suffer from these tragic accidents. And it's just become commonplace. And, you know, we move on and, you know, we, you know, these things happen and, you know, there's uproar, but there's never any systemic change behind the scenes because there's just not the motivation. It seems to, to do anything about it. It's become just a regular part of business. It seems in our communities, in our cities, in our towns, it's uh and, and there's really, you know, there's no, there's no desire to be different, you know, to, to really make substantive change to protect pedestrians, to protect everybody on our road, cyclists, even other drivers. I mean, people are, are running around in race cars these days and, you know, there's no traffic control. 
I live in a street where cars whip down every day. I've made numerous uh, complaints about it and always been met with, well, it's people in your neighborhood. You know, that's sort of the attitude, like nothing's been done to change it. And I, I literally worry every day that someone's going to get killed in front of my house. Well, first, let me say, Mark, how sorry I am to hear about your brother and just that it was right in front of your home and you live with that. And I've been to your house and you live on a quiet residential street. The idea that cars are zipping down your street makes me kind of crazy. Uh, we have a street here on the South Mountain in Tom Jackson's ward where there's kind of a bigger opening to our street and then it narrows in front of our house. And it took a decade for myself and our neighbor to get some speed bumps put in to slow down just so that all the kids on the street wouldn't get these cars coming up. But I have to mention, I don't know if there's a correlation here, but the gentleman who was killed by hit and run after Boris brought, like within days, was up on Upper Wentworth, not far from the link. And it was about two in the morning. And I remember one day last week, I don't know if it was the same night, waking up to the sound of super bikes or supercars doing a road race on the link. Like it woke me up with my windows closed. So there's street racing happening. It seems unabated. And, you know, God forbid it had anything to do with this latest killing. But these are killings. So let me go to you, Chris. I mean, you said you moved to Hamilton because you wanted to, because you like the cycling infrastructure. Many cyclists in the city have been killed and feel as though there's still vast swaths of the city that just aren't safe and connected for cyclists. What was your reaction to hearing about two hit and run? Um, these are pedestrian deaths, but there's certainly been cycling deaths as well. What was your reaction to the stories this week? And how do you feel the city is doing in terms of keeping pedestrians and cyclists safe? I, I, you know, it's just, it's just saddening. Uh, it's the way that we treat these accidents as a, a personal responsibility of the driver and not to say that there isn't some responsibility in, in all, you know, uh, car crashes because sometimes there's alcohol involved. Sometimes there's, uh, you know, other, other things it's, uh, it, there is sometimes an element of, of personal responsibility, but in terms of, of kind of shaping the roads around this, it's it's important that we don't just do this on a piecemeal basis. And that's what it feels like. I remember uh, a year or two ago, there was a, a child hit up on uh, up on the mountain. And, you know, there was calls for, for street safety and, and some changes. And if I recall, there were some changes, but it was only to that spot. I mean, it's not like this is a design that only exists where that child was hit. It's a, it's a design that happens that's everywhere in the city. So instead of doing a piecemeal change, they need to look at all of the areas that are dangerous now and make a proactive change because fixing it after someone gets hurt or after someone dies, it's it's it feels good for the family to have some sort of closure that that the street is now safer and hopefully that won't happen to someone again, but only in that one spot, not around the around the city. You make an excellent point, Chris, because I'm thinking about on our street, we proactively got the speed bumps in, but it took multiple emails to our to the councillor, whom I've, of course, known over the years. Uh, it took my neighbor doing a petition on the street to get it done. I mean, we had to proactively engage, engage, engage to get an obvious speed reduce, uh, you know, reduction mitigation factor on our street. And so, Brenda, let me go to you, because I saw a comment you have made on Facebook about this particular issue, about the, the road safety. You're very active in Ward 3. How do you feel with the news this week about these pedestrian deaths, but also some of these other issues around just how unsafe our streets seem? Well, um, the the one on the mountain, uh, the second one, um, he's actually the father of one of my good friend's grandchildren. So it kind of brought it more into reality, you know? Um, my feeling is, I think, like Chris was saying, the city isn't proactive, it's reactive. Someone gets killed, we better do something. If enough people ask for it, it'll happen. But how long does it take to happen? They move too slow. And like Chris said, it's one spot. We've been advocating as a neighborhood to have a crosswalk installed, um, a crossover for 10 years. And the community group has um, instigated studies with city departments, surveys. We've put all of that proof out there to the councillors at the time. And it's taken 10 years and it shouldn't take 
10 years to accomplish something in one little section of our city. And uh, on a personal note, I live on a one-way street that they, they say, oh, there's enough signs. It's just your neighbors speeding. People like to break the law and they won't come out if you report people, they won't do anything, you know? And the kids on my street stand at the corner and we have a very full neighborhood with a lot of children and the kids will go wrong way, buddy, you know? And, you know, I was personally called out and called names because I mentioned it to a driver, you know? But, um, we need to we need to have people in the city that know what it's like to stand at a bus stop and have a transport truck drive past you you know and and people who know what it's like to try and take your children to school pushing a buggy holding the hand of a toddler and cars are zipping past them you know, they need to be out on the street. Brenda, you've said so many things there um, that I want to unpack. First, though, I'm so sorry for your loss. These aren't just numbers or statistics. These are people with families and grandfathers and fathers and grandkids. And, it, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, to the idea that we're doing this kind of piecemeal reactionary, almost like a PR response, right? You know, we got to make that neighborhood feel better so they don't think that we're not doing a good job on street safety. But let's let's ignore the bigger picture. And, and Mark, let me go to you, because I think it's even more pernicious than that. I don't just think it's this laziness thing and and the idea as Brenda brought up that the the response is well people like to break the law it's just people who like to speed but then you try to do something about it and no enforcement is done (laughs) you know I could I could literally call the police maybe I'll do that all summer every time I'm woken up by the speeders on the link I'll just say hey by the way you can catch them you know here's where you need to go it's ridiculous it shouldn't be vigilante it shouldn't be us as a a there's a twitter feed now Mark where you can post Hamilton speeders I mean why are we as a community having to do this And so let me put that to you first, Mark. Why the hell isn't council doing its freaking job? And secondly, so a heavy truck ban on downtown was about to happen, a rerouting of these heavy trucks off of these streets down in the downtown wards, thankfully. And then we saw Councillor Marula say that he's going to put forward a motion I counsel this week to say, you know what, trucks stay essentially unless we expand the highways. I mean, what kind of a play is that? What what the hell is happening to you, Mark? Please help us, sir. Well, (laughs) you know, I've stopped taking anything Sam says seriously. You know, for me, it comes down to two things. I think about this a lot. Number one is enforcement. You know, there is no active campaign around street safety, street enforcement. So people like, you know, people have become, you know, they they don't see police around. And this isn't a criticism of the police. I mean, they have the resources that that they allocate, but from city hall should be like making, the council should be making an active effort to, you know, to deploy uh, its resources to areas where, you know, we, where people are complaining, where they've seen high risks and they should have a physical presence there. And I feel sometimes like the police think that's a little bit below them. I don't know, maybe you, however you want to do that. The second thing that gets me about all of this is that, you know, in Ontario, we have a system of what's called joint and several liability. In joint and several liability systems, all of these accidents, all these fatalities could potentially have civil civil uh, legal re- recourse, right? What happens at the end of the day, no matter what, is the municipality, i.e. taxpayers, end up paying massive personal injury or death settlements, and the, and the cost is going up and up and up. And the reality is, is that the, the cost for insurance is going up and up and up, and then the municipalities cry, foul that their insurance rates are going up. So what does that come down to? It comes down to risk management. Everything's about risk management, proper risk management. How are we managing the risk on our streets to make them safer? This should be a primary focus of our council and the staff and and to put a real effort. So come out with a whatever you want to call it, but we really need to clamp down on this. And, and you know, we, our city's built the way it is. It's, it's unfortunate. We can't change the sort of 
you know, the car built culture that we've created, everybody drives and, and it's become, you know, uh, more and more prevalent now with the pandemic, less people are nervous about, people are nervous about tr public transit and everything else, you know, that those are for the for people fortunate enough to own cars, but, you know, um, you know, we, we, we this is going to take a radical transformation of the way we live um, and the way we build the new Hamilton, which you know, hopefully involves intensification in, in the downtown core around transit corridors where cars, and maybe we get to the point where I would love to see this, where there are no cars downtown, or at least through main, uh, main, you know, main thoroughfares of the downtown, we get to the point where you know, it's cycle pedestrian friendly, but we need to have that as a goal. Like we need to set goals and we need to protect the tax base as well from these, you know, from the claims that are going to come from all these accidents. Well, I hope that you're right about Sam Marilla's motion being all fire and fury signifying nothing, um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but let me just go to you on this one, Chris, because as Mark was saying, you know, and you mentioned it's piecemeal and Mark is advocating for a better strategy. Uh, you know, there's a vision zero strategy, but we also know of there's, um, you know, Brent Toderin, who's a, obviously a, a celebrated urbanist, uh, talked about the pedestrianizing of downtowns, right? And Hamilton with its old buildings, although we have the aging infrastructure, it's a great opportunity for having those pedestrian corridors, those cobblestone roads, because we have the beautiful old buildings, right? We can do stuff here. And so what do you want to see from council? Because I agree with Mark, it's a political will issue. Where is the will? And are we coming into an election? Do we have the opportunity to make this a campaign priority uh, in this municipal election? I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, it, in terms of who we see running for council, we have, we're going to see a lot of turnover. And I'm, I'm hoping to see a lot of um, candidates who are pro- pedestrianization, pro, uh, you know, street safety and street comfort. Uh, I, I don't think that this is, I, I don't even want to use the term progressive at this point because street safety isn't a progressive thing. I mean, you're seeing it happen in Toronto and Guelph and Waterloo, Kitchener. You're seeing it happen in London. I mean, Hamilton is going to be the last city to to take this seriously. And, and it's really sad because Hamilton, I think the, one of the reasons I liked moving, the idea of moving here was I thought that Hamilton had the most potential out of any of those cities. And, uh, you know, the fact that we're the last ones to, to do that is just is just unfortunate. And then even just other basic things like James Street, you know, the poster child for for downtown renewal is, you know, a 50 kilometer hour street by default. There's been um, for years, there's been um, lip service given to safe streets, friendly streets. And and it's taken I haven't seen any major changes, you know? They talk about, oh, in 2026, this will happen. In 2024, this will happen. But yet they continue to, and they can say no trucks on Cannon Street, but how are they going to enforce it when they can't enforce no parking in bike lanes, you know? and. And I just feel like they talk about it, but they don't enforce it. You know, when Mayor Tory in Toronto decided that he wanted to get rid of those vehicles that were stopped blocking traffic, he did a blitz and got rid of them. It is possible for a mayor to lead the city and to get people focused. You guys have been amazing. Thank you for doing the O Show.